you are here for the stuff about Roman history, you're in the right place. If not, then, uh, sorry, you're lost. Mm. 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 So you want to join or? Just a workshop. No money, sir. Just a bit, just a bit. I, I, I need to be educated. So I don't I, I, I'm hoping that I'm not just going to stand up here and talk the whole time because. Uh, I think it's boring for me and for you if I'm just the only one talking. So I'm hoping that everyone's going to participate and talk a little bit and uh, hoping we can discuss some things and uh, think together about issues because there's a lot of stuff in uh, the history of the early church that I think can help us uh, kind of think through issues today from a different angle. Uh, so first I, uh, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and ask God to uh, give us wisdom for today. Almighty God, the fount of all wisdom, through whose Wisdom and will, the whole universe was made. Send down into our hearts the promised wisdom of the Holy Spirit that we may discern between what is and what is not. And that we may step back from where we are to see things as they truly are through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Alright, so first of all, um, there's of course a lot of Roman history, but I think it's appropriate to uh, start off with a bit of scripture, with uh, I think a verse that you may find quite familiar. The Great Commission. And this is going to shape, I think, our, um, our view of what the early Christians were doing in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, came back from the dead, there were two alternative responses to his resurrection. This is all in Matthew chapter 28, if you want to look it up right now. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus comes back from the dead, and there are two responses in that chapter. Two ways of responding to Jesus' resurrection. The first one is that the Jewish religious leaders get together. And they summon the guards who were guarding Jesus' tomb. And they say, All right. We know that uh, this tomb was under your watch. You weren't supposed to let anything happen. But you know what? We can let things slide if you, uh, you know, uh, if you take a bit of this money and tell everyone that what happened was that the disciples of Jesus came and stole the body while you were sleeping. Alright, this is, this is the narrative that we want everyone to believe. And Matthew reports that this fable or this story or this version of events is the one that's told among the Jews to this very day. That's one response to the resurrection of Christ. The other response is Jesus comes and he tells some of the women who see him, he says, I, I want to see my brothers on this uh, on a mountain um, in Galilee, I'm going to meet them there. So the eleven come to this mountain and some of them, some of them doubted, but they, but ultimately they worshipped at his feet. So, the other response 
On the one hand, on the left hand, you have this false story about Jesus' resurrection. That the disciples came and stole the body while the guards were sleeping. On the right hand, what's the other story? The other story is the one in the Great Commission. Jesus tells them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So that's, that's the other story. The one story is the disciples came and stole the body. The other story is all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And the way to respond, the way for those 11 of the 12, because Judas is gone, to respond is to go and teach all nations, to disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the world, or the very end of the age. So, so, we have two responses. Two responses to the resurrection of Jesus, and these are the two responses that make all the difference in the world. This is the difference between just uh, taking the hush money and giving the narrative that they want you to give. The difference between that and telling the dangerous truth that Jesus, the king of the whole world, has been raised from the dead and set in authority over all heaven and earth. All right, so. When we're looking at this thing grammatically, go ye therefore and teach, or go ye therefore and disciple whom? What is the thing whom are the, the, 11, the 11 disciples to teach or disciple? All the nations. So what are they teaching? Whom are they teaching? What are those units? Are they individuals? Are they families? What are they? Ethnic tribes. Ethnoi. Tribes. Nations. The unit of evangelism is nations. Not individuals, not families, but entire nations. Okay, so this is going to be the biblical basis that we start from to reflect on how these early Christians uh, moved about in the Roman Empire to bring the message of the kingdom of God. Right, so, we can start with the Apostle Paul. Uh, in the book of Acts. Yes? Hey, so, will we have this, what is this workshop about, or what are you saying? Yes, this workshop is about how the Christians in the Roman Empire dealt with the empire they were in and how God conquered that empire. Um, or aspects of how God conquered that empire. Obviously, that's a very rich history. We couldn't possibly cover that in an hour and a half or something. But um, this is where we want to start. So, so we have the Great Commission. Okay, so Paul. What happens to Paul in Acts? If you were to summarize across the entire sweep of Acts, what happens to Paul? How does he end up where he ends up at the end of the book? He travels three times around three trips. Travels three times? Same different cities and locations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's going everywhere. He is telling people about King Jesus. Uh, he gets... Uh, he's telling this message. Uh, he starts riots. Or... I should say other people start riots in response to him. He's not the one right. saying, let's riot. But, but riots start in response to him. Like this is not, this is not some, okay, here's some, some experience I had, take it or leave it. Okay, He's, he has some kind of dynamite message here that is causing people to get so mad that they're rioting against him in multiple cities. Sometimes they're even going to the next city where he is to start another riot. 
Pretty How does he end up where he ends up at the end of X? Where does he end up? Where is he at the end of X? Rome. 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 He is in house arrest in the center of a world empire. Rome. Did he intend to go to Rome? Is that the plan? Probably. Yes, I think. Yes. Because he appealed to who? Caesar. Caesar. He had a case. Another riot was started against him, as usual. As usual. He goes to a new city. There's a riot against him. This, this time it's Jerusalem, the very center of Israel. They start a riot against him. He's held for several years in prison as his case is being tried. And he... Who did he come before? Before he... Uh, who did he appear before? Before he appealed to Caesar. He appealed before, or he appeared before the Roman governor, Festus, and one of the Jewish uh, puppet kings there, Agrippa. So already, you're seeing him appear before kings, such as Agrippa, a Jewish king, but a king, and a Gentile governor, Festus. And this is the context in which he he gives his message. He says, you know, this is, this is what happened, and Jesus is king, and oh, do you want to become a Christian too? <laughs> and they're like, Paul, your great learning has driven you out of your mind. And they say it quietly to each other, if this man had not appealed to Caesar, we could have let him free. But no, he wants to appeal to Caesar. He wants to appeal his case to the emperor of one of the most powerful world empires of the time, Rome. So, this is already the kind of, let's say, missions strategy that we've... That this is already there, in the Bible already. So, so that's what we see in the pages of the Bible. Now, when we get beyond the Bible, so... So Paul lived around what, like the uh, 50s and 60s? He died in the 60s. He was killed under the Emperor Nero. Uh, so, so this is this is the witness that we get from just within the pages of the Bible. Now, if we go beyond the Bible, let's skip ahead 100 years, shall we? Okay, 100 years later. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Gladiator. Okay, who is Emperor at the beginning of the movie Gladiator? You may not remember, it's Marcus Aurelius. His son succeeds him, his son likes the whole gladiator thing, likes getting in the ring, his name is Commodus, but Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is highly renowned, even today, as a Stoic philosopher of the time. He was not only the Emperor, he was a philosopher. This is the kind of Emperor that most people dream of having someone who is highly intelligent, who is philosophical, who thinks things through. Go who... Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Little comedy. <laughs> he's, a, he's a real philosopher. To this day, people buy Marcus Aurelius's books. He's the emperor who's on the throne. <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> So let's see, um, let's see from the first apology of Justin Martyr in the reign of the previous king before Marcus Aurelius. Can I just ask about the year, is it AD 300? No, no, th this, this now is AD about 150. Okay. Yeah, so we're skipping about 100 years from, from Paul. Okay, this is called the first apology or the first defense. This is written by Justin Martyr, obviously he got martyred eventually, but uh, he was one of the church fathers, and he is defending the faith. Who is he writing to? He says, to the Emperor Titus, Elias, Adrianus, Antoninus, Pius, Augustus, Caesar. Okay, now known as Antoninus Titus, but these, th this was the the era of what they call the five good emperors. This is the time that when the Han Dynasty people heard about this era of Roman emperors, they said, wow, 
This is an, a, a time when people don't give the throne to their sons, but they give it to the best guy that they adopt. And they're like, they're, some of these Han Dynasty people are like, wow, that's so cool. It's like the times of Yao and Shun. So this is, this is already like, fairly ideal, you would think, but this, this Christian writer says to the Emperor Titus, okay, hold his whole long name, and to his son, Verissimus, the philosopher. <laughs> now, Verissimus, that is Marcus Aurelius. His, his name was Verus, that was his surname. Verus means true. He's calling him Verissimus, the truest, the most true. Because he already has a reputation as a philosopher. He already has a reputation as an honest person. So he's writing to this guy. His son, Verismus the philosopher, and to Lucius the philosopher, the, the natural son of Caesar, and the adopted son of Pius, a lover of learning, and to the sacred senate with the whole people of the Romans, I, Justin, the son of Priscus and grandson of Bacchus, natives of Flavia, Neapolis, and Palestine. Oh, so he's from the land of Israel. Present this address and petition on behalf of all those those of all nations. Yes. Sir. Just a quick uh, aside: Is uh, Justin Martyr was he at all quote unquote disciple by any of the apostles? He is John, or not John? known to have been discipled directly by the, the was disciples, he a part of but, church? but he lived at the same time yeah. as yeah. some yeah. of them. So, um, so he would be like a peer of. Yeah. Like the disciples, but other. His He'd be like a, a third generation of okay. Christian, probably. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, natives of Flavia Neapolis in Palestine present this, this address and petition on behalf of those of all nations who are unjustly hated and wantonly abused, myself being one of them. Okay, so he's writing to the emperors, he's writing to the Senate. This is just. A hundred years after Paul. Paul's already appealed to Caesar. This is still a pattern, it's not just Paul. The Christians continue to write to the people at the highest levels. They're writing to the emperor, they're appealing to the emperor. And. Well, okay, so this sounds very flattering at the beginning because you, you know you have to show respect and all that. What do you think his, his rhetorical strategy is? Do you think he's like um, Do you think he goes the soft way? Do you think he goes the aggressive way? What kind of style do you, What do you think his strategy looks like? In the way he talks. to get sympathy. So Sam says softer to get sympathy. All right, so we're thinking about, let's say, uh, worlds. Okay, so there's positive world. Aaron Ren talked about this last year at the conference, but we can imagine a positive world. So like maybe America 50 years ago. Positive world is when it's adv an advantage to, to identify as a Christian. That people think well of you if you identify as a Christian. People are positive toward Christians even if they're not Christian. Positive world. Neutral world, it's like a hobby to be a Christian. Negative world, you're a bad person if you're a Christian. Right now, in that realm, Christians are bad people for being Christians. Okay, so Sam thinks the soft approach. Yes. Let's see. Reason directs those who are truly pious and philosophical to honor and love only what is true, declining to follow traditional opinions if these be worthless. For not only does sound reason direct us to refuse the guidance of those who did or taught anything wrong, but it's incumbent on the lover of truth by all means, and if death be threatened even before his own life, to choose to do and say what is right. Do you then, since you are called pious and philosophers, guardians of justice and lovers of learning, <laughs> give good heed and hearken to my address? And if you are indeed such, if you are indeed such, it will be manifested. For we have come, 
not to flatter you by this writing, nor please you by our address, but to beg that you pass judgment after an accurate and searching investigation, not flattered by prejudice, not, not flattered by a desire of pleasing superstitious men, nor induced by irrational impulse or evil rumors that have been prevalent. No. But rather, to give a decision which will prove to be against yourselves. He's inviting them to give a decision against themselves. He's saying, I want you to give a decision that's going to condemn you. <laughs> for as for us, we reckon that no evil can be done to us unless we be convicted as evildoers or be proved to be wicked men. And you, you can kill, but not hurt us. Okay, that's just chapter 2. Chapter 45. How does he sound politically? And that God the Father of all would bring Christ to heaven after he had raised him from the dead, and would keep him there until he has subdued his enemies, the devils, and until the number of those who are foreknown by him as good and virtuous is complete, on whose account he has still delayed the consummation. Hear what was said by the prophet David. These are his words. What's he going to quote from scripture to them? The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send to you the rod of power out of Jerusalem and rule you in the midst of your enemies. With you is the government in the day of your power, in the beauties of your saints. From the womb of the morning have I begotten you. That which he says, he shall send to you the rod of power out of Jerusalem, is predictive of the mighty word which his apostles, going forth from Jerusalem, preached everywhere. And though death is decreed against those who teach or at all confess the name of Christ, we everywhere both embrace and teach it. And if you also read these words in a hostile spirit, that's a choice you can make. You can do no more, as I said before, than to kill us. That's all you can do to us is to kill us. That's the worst you can do which indeed does no harm to us. But to you and to all who unjustly hate us and do not repent, brings eternal punishment by fire. Okay, These, this is the kind of attitude that early Christians are showing in their public writings to the emperor of the most powerful empire in the world. It was both, really. He was, he was soft, but also hard. <laughs> so, yeah. so these, these people, I mean, Justin Martyr, he, he interacts with the philosophy. He knows his stuff. He's saying, hey, you, you, you say that you're the truest guy. You, you say that you love the truth. You say that you love all this philosophy and stuff. You say that you value truth over all these other things. Let's see if you mean it. Let's see if you're willing to make a judgment against yourselves, a judgment that condemns you. But if you don't make a judgment that condemns you, guess what? There is another judgment for you. Decking persecution, same thing. That's uh, in about 250. More persecutions. Cyprian says this. Cyprian says to a governor. Cyprian speaks to a governor. He says, you who judge others, be for once also a judge of yourself. Look into the hiding places of your own conscience. Nay, since now, 
There is not even any shame in your sin, and you are wicked. <laughs> As if it were rather the very wickedness itself that pleased you, do you, who are seen clearly and nakedly by all other men. Yourself also look upon yourself. For either you are swollen with pride, or greedy with avarice, or cruel with anger, or prodigal with gambling, or flushed with intemperance, or envious with jealousy, or unchaste with lust, or violent with cruelty. And do you wonder that God's anger increases in punishing the human race when the sin that is punished is daily increasing? Why is he writing this? Because the governor says the Christians are bad, and because the Christians are such terrible people, the Roman Empire is in such bad shape because the Christians are terrible people. He's like, look at yourself. You want to accuse us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Romans chapter 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. You, you complain that the enemy rises up. As if, though an enemy were wanting, there could be peace for you, even among the very togas of peace. You complain that the enemy rises up as if even though external arms and dangers from barbarians were repressed, the weapons of domestic assault from the calumnies and wrongs of powerful citizens would not be more ferocious, more harshly wielded within you. You don't need emperor, you don't need barbarians at the gates. Your crime rate is so high. Your people are just liars everywhere. You think you're just not going to collapse just like that? With You don't need barbarians to collapse. You're collapsing on your own. So, he, he's certainly commenting on uh, the society of the time. Lactantius. Plus, Lactantius in the 3rd century, no, 4th century, sorry. The beginning of the 4th century, Around the year 300, Lactantius was a teacher of rhetoric. Uh. He was an African um, from the city of Carthage. He taught rhetoric, and he was so good at his job teaching rhetoric that the emperor Diocletian hired him wow. to the imperial court. He is right there in the Chalotin as the imperial teacher of rhetoric. And at that time, the, a lot of Christians are philosophers at that time. A lot of Christians are Platonist people who developed the teaching of Plato, the philosophy of Plato. But there were other people who were not Christians who also developed the teaching of Plato. And at the court, at that time, there was a lot of debate about how this Roman Empire could hold together how this Roman Empire could be a pious empire, could please the higher beings and get their blessings so that Rome could continue to be great or to restore its former greatness. And some of these people say, well, there is one God because we've heard that from Plato, but also we, we have to do this stuff with the old gods. Uh, because it, it, it uh, because the ordinary people need to believe in uh, these these rituals that they do blah blah blah. At that time, the imperial court still used soothsayers. They still used heruspices. This means they would kill an animal, and so you know in China you'd you'd kill a turtle or something, and then you'd. You put its shell into the fire, you write a message on the shell, put it into the fire, take it back out, look at the cracks. The Romans did something similar except they would kill an animal and they would look at the guts. They read, read the guts and the gods would tell you, Apollo or someone would tell you what the future was or whatever it was. A message from the gods. Very important to them. There was one time that at the, at the court of Diocletian, they did one of these rituals. They did one of these rituals to read the entrails, the guts of the animal. It didn't work. 
The ritual didn't work. Why did the ritual not work? Because the Christians who had to be there, they were like, well, um, this is kind of an, uh, 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 kind of an idol worship ritual that we can't take part in, but we have to be here because it's part of our job. Because we're officials at court. So being Christians, they did this. And it was because they did this as Christians to remind themselves who they belong to that that ritual didn't work. The God said nothing. So the Christians were blamed, and it seems that they were justifiably blamed for this thing not working. But the people are like, the people at court are like, we can't even consult the gods. These Christians are in the way. They, the Christians are advancing their own vision of what it is to be a Roman, of what it is to have a Roman empire, what it is to please the one God. And so actually it was from these debates within the court that other Platonists started saying, well, they're not the real Platonists, these are not the real Platonists, these Christians are fake. If you go their way, if you do things politically their way, the empire will fall. And the Christians say, no, it's, you don't need us to, for, for the empire to fall, everything's falling to pieces. It was that year, 303, that the last great persecutions of Christian in the Roman Empire started. The emperor, the imperial court determined that they were going to wipe out Christianity altogether. Now already in previous uh, persecutions, some pastors had handed over Bibles, they had handed over uh, the, the, the patents and the chalices for Holy Communion, they had handed over uh, those, those kinds of precious objects that we use for the life of the church. Um, some people were already called traditores, or traitors, for doing so, but this was the last persecution, beginning in 303. Ten years later, Constantine is emperor. Ten years. Constantine is emperor, the Edict of Milan is issued, legalizing Christianity for the first time in the history of Rome. The church has gone through 300 years of being an illegal religion. Ten years from the start of that persecution. If you are a Christian in the year 303, you don't know what's going to happen. All you know is 50 years ago, the church endured a lot of persecution. The persecution was cut short because the emperor died because he went on a war against the Persians, so he got killed. But you've never seen any of these big persecutions. You've only heard of them from the old people at church in 303. It comes to you. You don't know the future. What are you going to do? What do you think is going to happen? What are you going to pray for? You might just pray, I mean, if you're... You might just be like, Oh dear God, please keep the emperor far, far away, please. Uh, protect us from persecution, please. Uh, just keep those officials away, make them not see us. But, it looks like the Christians were praying for a lot more. Because what they got, they got a lot more than just someone leaving them alone. They got the emperor himself becoming a Christian, miraculously, for the first time in the history of Rome. So, I would say, I don't know what Chinese Christians are praying today. I don't know what Chinese Christians are praying today in America. 
And I don't know what Chinese Christians are praying today in China. But this is the kind of, this was the kind of pretty aggressive discourse that they were engaging in. They were not, you know, hiding their heads into their, into their turtle shells. They were out there. They were aggressive. They were writing to the emperor. They were writing to the governors. They're saying, look at yourself. This, this, this thing, this wrong thing, it's unsustainable the, the way that you've done it. You're going to die. And this is, this is the way that they spoke to the kings and emperors for hundreds of years. These are the, this is the way that the Christian leaders for hundreds of years spoke to the leaders of the time. So I don't know, I don't know how Chinese Christians today in China want to speak to Xi Jinping. But, and I don't, I don't know if tomorrow he's going to become a Christian, right? None of us can know that. But what kind of prayers are we praying today? What are we mentally prepared for? And what are we laying the foundations for in the future so that if God brings that kind of miracle, we actually can step in and bring the kinds of changes where after Rome became a Christian empire over time, it didn't happen overnight under Constantine either, but the laws were changed over time they began more and more to reflect the values of the Bible. Over time, polygamy was, polygamy went away. Over time, slavery was abolished. Over time, all of these things happen. And it doesn't mean that it becomes this wonderful utopia, but it becomes a kind of emperor, uh, empire where those kinds of values are respected where the emperor himself has to recognize who Jesus is. Now, 70 years after Constantine became emperor, Theodosius I was emperor. And he was a Christian. He was, a, he was an Orthodox Christian, but he was a sinner too, just like you and me. Uh, as emperor, he went to Thessalonica. And there were some riots there. He, he put down those riots and he, he was really angry. And he, as, even though he was a Christian, he couldn't, he didn't control his anger. He massacred 7,000 people. 7,000 innocents in Thessalonica. So, okay, um, sometimes you have a Christian who's, who's like that. It doesn't mean he's not a true believer, but sometimes a Christian will make a terrible mistake like that. He'll commit a terrible sin like that. So he takes his troops home, he goes back home to his capital. The big pastor in that city, Ambrose of Milan, Bishop of Milan, says, Your Majesty. <laughs> You're coming to church? <laughs> you just killed, massacred 7,000 innocents in Thessalonica. You've just gotten back. Go home. Go home. Repent before God with tears. You can always find the Lord. The Lord is always there to be found. He is waiting for you to repent, but you have to repent. Once you've repented, come back and join us in the worship of the Lord. This, that was the kind of change that transpired in the Roman Empire over the course of 70 years. 70 years after that last great persecution began. So when we, we always think that a lot of stuff is far, far, far away. But the God that we have is close. The God that we have is closer to us than our hearts. The God that we have could change things tomorrow. He could make Xi Jinping 
a believer tomorrow if you want it. But are we ready for that kind of thing? Are our own hearts ready for that kind of change? And what kinds of changes do we need to make in the culture of the church, in our own expectations, in the way that we pray individually and together in order to pursue these kinds of changes that are not theoretical. These are not theoretical. God has done this before. This is history. This is not theory. So, um, yeah, I, I'd like to open the discussion to everyone uh, about about issues that we face today. Um, how can how can these examples from the early history of the church in the Roman Empire uh, encourage us today and help shape our sense of wisdom uh, to deal with the kinds of problems, and the kinds of challenges that we're looking at today. Thank you.